Again, this is our first Corinthians class. This is class seven. Marshall will be teaching next week as Linda and I will be out of town celebrating our hard to believe 43rd anniversary um, coming up this coming up this week. But uh, this is our seventh class, and Marshall's going to be in chapter five. My goal is to get through three and four. If I don't, well, we just won't. But <laughs> that's my goal because he's going to do chapter five next week, starting there. I want to remind us our mantra for this class is to be uh, have all readiness of mind like the Bereans and to search the scriptures daily and be in the Lord's work. Before we get into chapter three, we're actually I'm going to pick up on verse five. If y'all want to turn there. Get a little back, uh, continue with that. But I want to remind us, Paul is continuing his theme. No divisions among you. He wants them to be united, to be perfectly joined together. Now, <clears throat> starting in verse 5, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom he believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Again, he's talking about the divisions. I'm of, I'm of Paul, I'm of, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. These divisions. He says, who are we? We are nothing. We are only ministers. And we have different jobs. Apollos watered. I planted, <clears throat> but neither of us is anything. It's all about God and giving God the glory. Starting in verse 8. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. Notice they're united even though they have different jobs. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. And how are they one? They're one because they are one in service to God. They are one in purpose. And that purpose is salvation of souls. And that's what we have to keep in mind. That is our purpose today. It doesn't matter which area. If somebody plants, somebody waters, it doesn't matter. We all need to be planting. We all need to be watering. And we can support each other that, keeping the goal in mind. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. This we here in this verse means Paul and Apollos as labors, again, working together. Faithful teachers, <clears throat> God's fellow workers. He says God's field. Literally, this is God's teal field. And sorry, I... I want to know the screen. It goes, <clears throat> reminded me of John 4, 35. It says, when the Lord says, behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white with harvest. And that's still true today. You know, God's field is already tilled. It's already planted. We've just got to be out there and be workers in it. God's building. God used Paul to lay the foundation. But remember, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. And that's the most important part. If you're in the building business, you know, if you don't get that cornerstone set right and everything's laid upon it right, it will not be, <clears throat> your building will not continue. Verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given to me as a wise and master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. I want to talk about the grace of God here for a minute. I know we spent last week on Ephesians 8, 9, and 10. And I didn't put that in section 1 up there just because I didn't have enough room. But we understand and we know we are saved by grace. We are called by grace. Paul was made a minister by grace. He labored by God's grace, and God's grace is abundant with faith and love, 1 Timothy 1.14. God's grace is for all men, Titus 2.11, and God's saving grace is conditional. That's some one thing people don't comprehend, 2 Corinthians 6, one. But I want to talk about as the next section. As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Now, the Greek word for master builder here is architecton. The archie part is master or chief, and tecton is the builder or craftsman, or um, could be a woodworker. But uh, Paul's saying, and this is the only occurrence in the New Testament, he says, I am the chief craftsman, the master builder, and I have laid the foundation. Paul did the first work that he might not build on another's foundation. We discussed Romans 15, 20 last week. But I want to really focus on take heed how he builds it. Notice this part. This is, you know, teachers and preachers 
must teach and preach the truth. James 3.1 says teachers will be held to a higher standard. And if we, you know, preachers and teachers are builders of God's house. And we build God's house by converting others to Christ, to Christianity, by saving souls. Then they also build by teaching and encouraging Christians. And hopefully each one of you is edified by being here this morning. But this warning must not be ignored because there is a great danger in using false teaching and false methods in trying to convert those souls or teach them about false doctrine. Um, and again, these teachers and preachers will be held to a higher standard. And you've got to be careful and make sure you are teaching and preaching the truth. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid which is jesus christ notice it's already laid the foundation is laid and no other foundation can anyone lay since jesus is the chief cornerstone the foundation any other savior would not be the true savior second corinthians eleven four, and no other person and no other doctrine can equal to jesus and his gospel to preach another is to be an anathema an anathema means basically devoted to destruction in galatians 1 6 9 paul makes this very plain he says if i or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel let him be accursed or let him be an anathema now notice this you know i can think of two other religions off the top of my head and both of them claim an angel from heaven told them what to write in their books and their new revelation books or their latter-day books these are an anathema it does if an angel from heaven those those gospels are different than what paul preached and you can compare the two and read them and you can see for yourself the errors that are in there and now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold silver precious stones wood hay or straw um, notice this, anyone builds, Paul mentioned six building materials, three are perishable and three are non-perishable. You've got your gold, silver, precious stones are non-perishable. They will stand the test. Wood, hay, and stubble are perishable. They will not stand the test. These building materials in this verse represent converts, those who obey God's plan of salvation when taught by members of the church. Note, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Notice, Christians cannot know the hearts of those they convert, but each convert's heart will be made known by their future actions. Um, the fruit is... You know, they'll be known by their fruits, what I was going on to say. You know, and this day here is the great day of judgment when the thoughts and the intents of the heart, as well as their deeds, will be made known. Um, because it will be revealed by fire. Now, this could mean the converts are being tried by temptations and trials, you know, the fiery trials of life. Or this could mean the fires of judgment. This idea um, for the fire does go well with the day in the preceding clause there. But Bible scholars are actually divided on this, which meaning is correct. But, you know, the fiery trials of life and the, the fires of judgment could be dual. It could mean both of these things. Uh, and that's actually what I think it means. If anyone's work, which he has built on, endures, he will receive a reward. Notice the only the gold, silver, and precious stones will endure the fire. The wood, the hay, the stubble will perish. Those who will not endure are those converts who are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They are the people burdened with cares, riches, and pleasures of the world and who bring no fruit to maturity. Just like the sower of the seed parable back in Luke 8 and the ones that uh, the seed that was uh, cast them on the thorns and it grew up but uh, it says that they went away because they went back into the cares of the world now if anyone's work is burned he will suffer loss but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire if anyone's work is burned this refers to the converts 
a Christian has made who cannot endure the test of the fire. Again, these converts, they become converts, but then they go back into the world. They can't stand or handle the fires of life. I remember a preacher telling me one time that, you know, when you are a sinner, Satan has you. There's no reason for him to tempt you or come after you. He's already got you. But when you become a Christian, buddy, you better get ready because he is coming after you. And some people can't handle that. And they go back into the cares of the world. But he himself will be saved. You know, when converts may be lost, as they go back in the world, they fall away from Christ. But he can, but the person can be saved by remaining faithful until death as we're commanded in Revelation 2.10. And that's what all of us have to be striving for is remain faithful unto death at, once you become a Christian. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Greek word here for you is st. It's plural. And this means all Christians. But since Christians make the temple, we should not be divided. You know, we are the temple of God collectively as Christians. And we should live our lives and teach others to glorify God with our lives. That is what we're here for, to glorify God and to seek and save the lost and bring others with us. And that temple word here is actually interesting. It's naos, which is translated temple. And this is used for the holy of holies. He's saying you are the holy of holies of God. Do we see ourselves that way? When you look in the mirror, is that what you see? Uh, that you are in the holy of holies because the Spirit of God dwells in you? We, it's why it's imperative. We keep ourselves separated from the world because the Spirit of God dwells in us and we are part of the holy of holies set apart inside the temple. This is not the Greek word herion, which stands for the whole temple complex together. So I want you to really think about that. When you see yourself, see yourself holy. The, it's part of the holy of holies, where God is, because God dwells in you. If anyone defiles the temple, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are defiles the temple. How can this happen? When we discussed this last week in Galatians 5, 19-21, when we read the whole works of the flesh there, we were mainly talking about jealousy and envy and division. But those works of the flesh, or any of them, defiles the temple of God. And again, he's speaking specifically about division here in this section. And this Greek word, phytheira, defiles means to decrupt or destroy you know the local temple is corrupted when it is led away from the condition of holiness of life and purity of doctrine in which it should stand first corinthians 15 33 second corinthians 11 3 and jude 10 we have to remain holy keep ourselves set apart for the glory of god if Sorry, that holiness of life and purity of dark doctrine. We have to be careful. Keep our doctrine pure. Teach only the truth and remain holy in this life, separated from the world. Again, this is not talking about physical death. God will destroy him. Hebrews 9 27 is there's it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment this is talking about the second death that judgment part romans 8 13 revelation 21 8 which is a separation from god in eternal punishment this shows us the seriousness of the sin condition in the church at corinth and it should because it show us today it applies to the church today we've cannot defile the temple of God. God is holy, and he cannot be around sin. God is in us. We have to keep ourselves holy and unspotted from the world. The temple of God is holy. You know, 
How is it holy? It is cleansed by the blood of Christ, John 1, 7. It is sanctified by the work of the Holy Spirit, Romans 15, 16. It is washed with water, Ephesians 5, 26, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, Titus 3, 5, Hebrews 10, 22. The temple of God is holy. Again, which temple you are. We have been sanctified. We have been cleansed. We have been washed. If you are a Christian, then we have to remain faithful unto death and keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Keep our focus on heaven as our goal. Always remember, keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye on heaven. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, <clears throat> that he may become wise. Let no one deceive himself. You know, this is, <clears throat> again, warning those who had the envy, jealousy, and the visions of that congregation. We can do the same thing ourselves. You know, we can easily deceive ourselves. You know, by one, relying on self and not on God, by not using God's word as our standard and our guide. And actually, I started to make a whole list of these things. But, you know, think about it. They can be puffed up. Um, all these things they were having issues with. <clears throat> if anyone among you seems to be wise in this age. Again, this is talking aimed at the scribes and the philosophers mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1, 20 and 25, the worldly wisdom divided the church into these different factions, but godly wisdom unites. And that's what we have to continue to seek ourselves with. Let him become a fool that he may become wise. You know, following God's wisdom will make one seem a fool in the eyes of the world. Hopefully we'll get to 1 Corinthians 4, 10 today. <clears throat> you know, the world doesn't understand Humility, submission, obedience. Doesn't understand turning the other cheek, as Jesus said. But submitting to God and following Jesus to be a fool of the world should be our goal. Verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. This re <clears throat> refers again to the wisdom of the high-minded philosophers in which they cause these division. He catches the wise. This is actually a quote from Job. 513, these are the worldly wisdom. <clears throat> he catches them in their own craftiness. The craftiness word here is panergia, I think how you say that, which means trickery and unscrupulous conduct. And, and this is directly from the expository's Greek New Testament. It says, when the world schemers think themselves the cleverest, provident catches them in their own toils. I mean, how many of you know people? who think they're so clever, they're so doing these things, they're trying to be you know, trickery and unscrupulous, and yet they get caught up in their own toils and failures. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. They are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. <clears throat> He's telling them, you know, everything is yours in the world. Remember who these people were? These were Christians with the Holy Spirit, with all these miraculous gifts. But whether Paul or C Paulus or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. I mean, you've got all the things of the world, he's saying, and you've got life. Now, death, you know, it says death is our enemy in 2 Corinthians 15, but, you know, is death an enemy to the Christian? No, it is not. Death is your reward, your transition. You know, <clears throat> Uh, you are Christ and Christ is God. <clears throat> you are Christ. You ever thought about that? You know, we're talking to these Corinthians here, but how were the Christians in Corinth Christ? By creation, just as we are. John 1, 1 through 3, Colossians 1, 16, Hebrews 1 and 2. By redemption, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. By consecration, 2 Corinthians 8, 3. And Christ is God's. How? Because he is God's son in his divine nature. <clears throat> Excuse me, Romans 1 4, in his human nature, Luke 1 31 and 32, and God is his head, 1 Corinthians 11 3. Now we're getting into chapter 4. Let a man now consider us, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And that word servant there is kind of interesting. This is the word used for the lower 
rowing person on the boat. You know, they had different levels. The man down in the hole, which is normally the slaves that are doing the actual rowing in the boat. That's the word, Greek word there for that steward. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. You know, do you think about that? Why would Paul even have to say that? that one be found faithful. That word could be translated trustworthy. You know, God requires His stewards, us, to be faithful. You know, He can't go to heaven without doing what God requires to be done. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sorry, I think I got an extra... Okay. That's your slide in there. Again, okay, faithful and trustworthy. <clears throat> Why is it required to be faithful? Again, because of our relationship to Jesus, because he must answer to Jesus for the use of what he has been given in this life. Again, we all have talents. We don't want to be like that one talent man. Remember what happened to him? It was taken from him. <clears throat> he was cast, cast out. We need to be use what God has given us because it is unfaithful. The unfaithful, he dishonors Jesus who is his master because he is unfaithful and he causes others to be lost. Think about that. I, I, this is one of the things I never could overcome with my father to get him to become a Christian. He said, I was with all these people all week long. I know what they were doing. I know what they were involved in. I was with them at the beer joint. And then they're at church on Sundays. He said, they just a bunch of hypocrites. He could not overcome that. We have to be careful. If we're going to wear the name Christian, we have to be holy. Our conduct has to be above reproach. <clears throat> Always because of who our master is. <clears throat> but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by the human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. This Greek word here, anireno, which means to examine, investigate, question. Paul's explaining that he is not the one who should pass sentence on the fulfillment or the non-fulfillment of his duty. He's saying God is going to do that. He is not saying it's wrong to examine our spiritual condition because 2 Corinthians 15.5 and 2 Peter 1, 10-11, Paul says in 2 Corinthians here, he says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourself that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? <clears throat> Again, I want to point out Jesus Christ is in you. You know, it said talk about the Spirit of God being us. Now this verse says Jesus Christ is in you. And there's another verse that says God is in you. So actually, and we talk about the indwelling the Holy Spirit, but the Scripture plainly says Jesus is in us, the Spirit is in us, and God is in us. <clears throat> For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified this, but he who judges me is in the Lord. We should understand that man is not his own final judge, that our hearts can deceive us, but God can never be deceived. He who judges me is the Lord. Remember, God will judge mankind and our secrets by the standard of the gospel. That's why it's imperative that we know the book. You know, I know, you know the world says, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Well, God's going to say, ignorance of my word is no excuse. We have to know what we are going to be judged by. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will, bring, who, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Judge nothing before the time. Let's talk about that a minute. Judging now on the basis of human standards of wisdom is pointless. Again, what's our goal? Focus towards heaven. When the Lord returns, all will receive their complete and final judgment. Jesus spoke about that in Matthew 25, 31 through 30, 46. This does not mean that all judging is wrong. We have to judge righteous judgment, John 7.24 tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.14. We are to judge based on the word of God, righteous judgment. 
Verse 5, therefore, judge, uh, I'm sorry, the next section, until the Lord comes. I want to talk about that section again because there is a lot of confusion in the world about the Lord coming. Um, you know, and I was thinking about this this morning about the uh, Hamas and Israel conflict that's going on. Now, I don't know what's going to happen there, but it makes me wonder maybe the Lord's going to let Israel be destroyed just so people can understand, this is not going to be my home. I'm not coming back here. I don't know. I just had that thought this morning coming in as I was listening to something that mentioned about that war. Because everybody, you know, that's the whole reason I think Israel was set up in 1948 because the people of the false religions was teaching, you know, God needs a place to, 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 uh, be, to come and to set up his kingdom on this earth where he's going to rule. But 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 plainly tells us, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. I mean, this verse, he's, Paul is telling these Thessalonians. Now, they were concerned. Again, they knew the Lord was coming back, but they were concerned because all these members had passed away, and he's giving them comfort. Don't, it's okay that they passed away. Don't worry about them. <clears throat> he's telling them, you know, the dead will rise again in verse 14. Then he's telling them, the, when the Lord comes with a shout, with an archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first in verse 16. But notice the 17. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus shall always be with the Lord. Doesn't sound like what the world teaches, does it? And then 2 Thessalonians 1, 7b through 10, last of that verse says, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice two distinct people. Do not know God, do not obey the gospel. So, you know, the... It's hard for us to conceive, and I've heard people say this, what's going to happen to these poor people that have never heard the gospel of Jesus? This verse tells us what's going to happen to them. That's why it's imperative to us to take the gospel to everyone, to try and teach them the gospel. Do not obey the ones that you try to teach, and they don't obey, they reject it. This is what's going to happen. He's going to take vengeance on those. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and to be admired among those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Again, this is a why it's so imperative for us to teach and preach and spread the gospel to everyone. Back to, our, <clears throat> back to our 1 Corinthians. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes that you may learn in us and not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against another. Paul warned them to learn not to exalt themselves as head of factions or divisions in the Lord's church. This may be given as a general warning to not go beyond also what is written in the doctrine or practice. Go beyond what is written. You know, and again, being puffed up can be one of, uh, be a sin. I have to be careful about that because that can definitely cause factions. 
For he who makes you differ from another, or what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You know, this is referring to all those spiritual gifts they had, the knowledge they had received from God through His Spirit. There is no reason for them to boast and certainly no justification to divide the congregation into contentious groups. And we see that as we get on into verse, thir you know, was it uh, 12, 13, and 14, uh, really just 12 and 14, which is talking about the spiritual gifts and how they thought one gift was better than the other. He said, you didn't do anything to receive this gift. It was freely given to you. You've got no reason to be boasting in it. These miraculous abilities were given to them and they're all gifts from God. Same way with us and our talents. I had a very wealthy man tell me one time, he says, I've got no reason why the Lord has blessed me so much. He said, I got, I got no understanding of it. I can't even comprehend it. But he was a very generous giver. But I, I, he realized everything came from God. It had nothing to do with him. You are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did reign, that we might also reign with you. You know, Paul is using sarcasm here to help them realize the foolishness of his actions. I mean, of their actions. They thought they were superior, no longer needed the leadership of the apostles. For I think that God has displayed us. The apostles last as men condemned to death, but we have made we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. That word displayed us is the Greek word apodikinum, which was used to exhibit gladiators in the arena. Think about it, you've got all the arena around, you've got the gladiators down in the he's dis, their own display down there, and that's what he's saying. The, the apostles were made spectacles in the same way gladiators are made spectacles in the arena. In this way, they were made both men and angels. <clears throat> Excuse me. And again, only John avoided the martyr's, martyr's death. All the other apostles were martyred for Christ's sake. And John, I read, and I don't know, I, I should, it just, just popped in my head. I remember reading the commentary one time, and Bart, Marshall, you might be able to help me with this if this is true or not. Correct me if I'm wrong, but read somewhere that they tried to kill John. They tried to boil him in oil, and he didn't die. And that's when they sent him to Patmos because they did try to kill him, but he he didn't die because the Lord wouldn't let him be died. But can, can you imagine being boiled in oil, trying to be killed, and then being exiled to Patmos? I mean, to live, I don't know. To, to me, death would have been the better thing to have happened. For we are fools for Christ's sake. But you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, and we are dishonored. Again, these sarcastic contrasts was clearly to show their extreme foolishness of self-conceit, self-flattery, and self-examination. Same thing we can all get caught up in if we are not careful. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst. We are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. Think about what Paul, what the condition these apostles were in. I mean, how many of us, how many of us hardly, we look poorly clothed. We all got clothes on, right? How many of us have been beaten lately? You know? We labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscurring of all things until now. Think about the words of Jesus here. Jesus said, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you. And persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Being defamed, we entreat. First Peter says, Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return? When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Again, this is seen as foolishness of the world. They can't even understand it. We've got to become fools like this for Christ. I do not write these things to shame you, 
But as my beloved children, I warn you. Again, Paul wanted them to understand why he was using sarcasm here. He wanted to warn them. Paul's words of warning was as a father to his children. 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 12. For though you might have been... Might, I'm sorry, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ I have begotten you through the gospel. Again, I don't know if you've converted somebody before, but when you do, you have an extra interest in them. You have a special interest in them. You want them to succeed, sometimes more than they, want them, than they themselves want to succeed. And that's what Paul's saying here. As a father to them, he's trying to get them to understand what their sin is all about and recognize it and repent of it. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me, for this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in the church. Notice Paul's doctrine in 1 Timothy um, 6.3 at the end in 2 Timothy 3.10. Paul's conduct, his manner of life, 2 Timothy 3.10. Paul's way of establishing and building up congregations for the Lord's church. In verse 17, 17 here at the end, he says, I teach everywhere in every church. You know, Paul was consistent in his doctrine and his work. This is not surprising since the Lord who guided him is unchangeable, Hebrews 13, 8. Sorry, I had to make that a little smaller to make it fit. But we have to, you read Paul's letters. He's consistent. You notice I flip back and forth through his Ephesians letter we've talked about. You know, the different letters he's written and Thessalonians, Corinthians, they're all very congruent with everybody. Everything he taught to all the churches, he taught the same thing. He did, you know, he did not direct Paul to teach differently in different places. That he there is, is the Spirit of God. <coughs> the churches that differ from those that Paul built are not the Lord's church today. I should have put that on there. Today. Now some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you. Notice this. This is a picture of their conceit because of their worldly learning. They thought Paul may be, come, be afraid to meet them face to face because, um, again, they thought they were smarter than he was. They didn't need these apostles anymore. Um, maybe some were boasting that he would not even come back to them. But I, he says, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills. He always said that, if the Lord wills, and I will know, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. Again, this is to let his enemies know that he wasn't afraid of them. He already had plans to go to Corinth in 1 Corinthians 16, 5 and 9. He tells him he warns his enemies of what he might do to them in 2 Corinthians um, 13, 2 through 4. But notice also, but the power. Paul would show them his courage and superior power. He was, as it were, challenging them to a showdown here. You know, there are some who claim to be greater than Paul, while others deny what he, that he was a true apostle sent by God. Paul could clearly show that God was with him by the miracles he was able to do. For the kingdom of God is not in the word, but in power. The kingdom of Christ... It um, is established and is not maintained by pompous speeches or words of human wisdom, but in power. The power in Paul's time was exercised in miracles. The power then and now to save people is the gospel, Romans 16, verse 1. What do you want, he says, shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? He's saying this is up to you, you know, up to Paul, the decisions up to Paul's enemies. Shall I come with a rod or or in love and spirit of gentleness. You know, think about that. Paul had the power to bring a rod of punishment upon his enemies if it became necessary. In Acts 13, 8 through 11, we read where Paul made El I say that Elmas the sorcerer blinded because he confronted Paul. Paul had the power to do such a thing. That would have been the rod. And he could use his power unless they repented. Or in love and a spirit of gentleness. But this is what he wanted. He said, this shows the love of a father for his spiritual children. It is like the gentleness of a nursing mother. Again, I mentioned this, 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8 before, and it says, but we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so effective, 
affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. Wow, I took several of these, uh, my slides out because I was afraid I wasn't going to get through, but I have finished. <laughs> Marshall, again, will be teaching next week for me in this class, and, this, and he will be teaching. Hope, I don't know how far he will get or he plans on getting. He's going to try to do all of Chapter 5, Marshall? All of Chapter 5, so then hopefully the week after that. Yeah. I'm sorry? We'll get her started. We'll get her started. Okay, and the week after I'll even pick up on Chapter 6. So looks like we've got about a minute and a half before that second bell. If you guys want to uh, uh, converse a little bit. Thank you very much for your kind attention.